I'm reading from the book of Luke, chapter 21 and verse 26. It says, men's hearts, failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, but the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now, let me just stop right there and say this. How can people's hearts be failing them for fear if there's nothing to look at? <clears throat> it says, looking after those things which are coming. If you can't see things that's coming, why are you looking in the first place? Sometime you need a minister, a man of the word, to help you see things that's coming. Most everybody can see it on your own because you're spiritual and you're established and you're mature in God. Sometimes other people need help, and that's why we're here. Luke 21, 26 in the New Living Translation says, people will be terrified at what they see coming upon the earth. I, I just want to ask this question. If this is a true scripture, which we all know that it is, people will be terrified what they see coming upon the earth. How, how do you expect me and any other preacher to hold my peace? I just can't do it. I just can't do it. And it says, for the powers in the heavens will be shaken. I I would love to go right there on that last phrase, powers in heaven shall be shaken, because I've got some stuff in here that I'd really like to share, but I can't do it today. Luke 14, 16, 17. Then said he unto, them, uh, unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many. He sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, and here's what, here's what the word was. Come, because all things are now ready. All things are now ready. Let me ask you a question. How many of you believe, watching me at home and those of you watching by television and those of you that's here, how many of you really believe, as best that you can understand things, how many of you believe that we are approaching the time where all things are getting ready? Yeah. And I know you believe that. And those of you at home, I know you believe that too. And I know there's a lot of people that don't believe it, but if they had information, they would believe it. It's just that information doesn't need to be withheld in this hour. It needs to be shared. So I'm going to speak today on what if. Are you prepared for the end time deception? What if? <clears throat> and I'm preaching today, and I'm going to be asking the question, well, what if I'm right? Or what if the word is right? And what if you're not? So that's what I want to talk about. Y'all ready? Yeah. Let's get started. Be seated. If we could peek into the unseen realm, God's built us for our optics, our eyes, and our ears to see the natural. We have a cornea. We have the retina, we have the optic nerve, we have the hearing. God made us to where we pick up on things in the natural. We can see them, we can hear them, we can feel them. But if we could peek into the realm outside of the natural realm, if we could peek into and hear what the ears can't hear, and if we could see what the eyes can't see and what they can't pick up on because it's in the natural, what do you think we might be seeing right now? That's what I want to talk about today. What do you think we might be seeing right now? I think we might be shocked at the activity and the preparations that's going on on three different levels. I've told this before, and I'll just tell you again, it, this is a good illustration. It's one of the best illustrations I can think of. If I'm leaving this area and I'm going up to Minneapolis, when I first leave town, there's no signs at all that says Minneapolis. You don't really begin to see any sign that says Minneapolis until you get up around Des Moines, Iowa. And when you get up around Des Moines, it'll say something like, uh, Minneapolis, 364 miles, something like that. And then you see the first indicator pretty good ways out to let you know that it's coming this way. You keep going the way you're going, Minneapolis is coming your way. 
So as you approach Minneapolis and you get about 100 miles out, then you begin to see a lot more signs because you're now in proximity. And then whenever you actually pull in to Minnesota and you get into Minneapolis, then you see signs everywhere. You see Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, uh, Minneapolis um, Better Business Bureau. You see Minneapolis Library, Public Library. You see Minneapolis, Minneapolis, Minneapolis everywhere. Uh, downtown Minneapolis, next seven exits. You see Minneapolis everywhere. Why? Because now you're in proximity and the signs are everywhere. Well, the way things have been is we've been talking about the coming of the Lord. And there's been many predecessors that has preached about the coming of the Lord, including my pastor. He kept preaching it to us. It's coming. It's coming. We've heard other preachers down through the years, Clarence Larkin. We've heard other ones, you know, that's preached down through the years. So many prophetic preachers that have told us faithfully about the coming of the Lord. And I grew up with it. And my pastor used to preach about the coming of the Lord regularly. And I'm glad he did because it helped me to live on the edge. It helped me to live thinking about it and prepared for it. And he preached it regularly, although it wasn't about to happen in the next few years. And I know that because I look back and it hadn't happened yet. So now we see that we're getting into the area now past Des Moines. And we're coming into the city limits of the coming of Christ. And we see the signs now everywhere. They are in the land. They are in the heavens. They're in politics. They're in technology. They're in big pharma. There's all kinds of signs that the Bible painted in the scriptures describing how it would be right before his coming. There's signs in Israel. There's signs in the nations of the earth. There's signs in the church. There's signs everywhere. They're everywhere. It's not just a sign here or there, but they're everywhere now, everywhere. To the point that sometime I see something on Monday, and I plan on talking about it on Sunday, but before Sunday can come along, two other things have happened, and I have to replace what I was going to talk about Monday. You see what I'm saying? That's how fast they're happening. They're happening that fast. Number one thing I want to talk about is great preparations are now being made in heaven. There's no doubt in my mind that we are living in the days of final preparations. And the days of final preparations are busy, and there's a lot of people involved. And I believe the Holy Spirit, if He could pull the scales off of our eyes, um, believers would be both joyful and horrified at what they see. I think we would be asking what, what are they rushing around in heaven for? What's all the rush? What's going on? What's all the activity about? Why is everyone in heaven so intense? What's all the elaborate, mind-boggling preparations about? What's all the angels so busy for and scurrying around breathlessly? What's about to happen? And it's true that the Bible says no man knows the day nor the hour of the coming of the Son of Man not the Son nor the angels. That's what the Bible said. It said the Son doesn't know nor the angels. That's with the Father. The Father will turn to the Son and say it's time. But because we don't know the day nor the hour, it doesn't mean that we won't know the season. And we are in the season, for sure, of the coming of the Lord. But the Bible says that there's great preparations. Anytime God gets ready to do something, even at the birth of Christ, there was a lot of flurry of activity even before he was born on the earth. So there's a lot of anticipation of the ages right now. A lot of anticipation. And for us to be able to talk about this in a message, it's really encouraging. Angels are going to be involved in the coming of Christ, especially before his second coming. They're going to be involved. They're going to be prepared to take their positions and to usher in unbelievable judgments that's coming upon the earth. And these judgments will be carried out by angels. 
These judgments that's coming upon the earth are designated, they are set, they're not going to be changed, God's not going to change his mind, they're set, they're going to happen. And they're going to be happening on the earth with such destructive force that words really fail to be able to describe the kind of destructive force that's coming. These angels are now preparing to take their position on the stage. They know that the end of the age has come. Don't be mistaken and believe that heaven is lethargic and that heaven is unprepared and their mindset is not being ready. They're being ready. God does everything with excellence. God does everything with absolute excellence. Look at creation. Everything that he does, he long before it happens, he's already prepared for it. Got everything in motion, got everything in place. And he has you in mind. And he has eternity in mind. But don't think that heaven is just sitting around, sitting around waiting for the last soul to be saved before God rises up and does something. That, no, no, no. I believe there'll come a day that the last soul will be saved and it'll all be over. But in the meantime, there's great preparations that's going on. Heaven is busy. During creation, God worked six days. Now at the close of the dispensational ages, he's also diligently preparing for the climactic events that will end all time. Time will be no more. And God appointed man, the number six, we're coming up now on the last dispensation of the millennial reign of Christ. At the end and the close of this dispensation, he's also diligently preparing climactic events that's going to be taking place. And that's why I'm behind this pulpit talking about it, because he wants you to know. And I want you to know. So in Revelation chapter 6, <clears throat> it says, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. And John, now this is John the Revelator. Let me talk, start right here and explain something to you. The last book of your Bible is the book of the Revelation. It's not Revelations. The book of Revelation is not the book of Revelations. It's not a bunch of Revelations in here. It is only one Revelation. This is it right here. It is the Revelation of Jesus Christ. It is this much of your Bible, 22 chapters. The reason it's in your Bible at the end of your Bible is because this ends up everything. That means that the ages will close. It means that <clears throat> the, er, er, all the things that God has in mind to close out this generation and to close out this era of mankind and his rule on the earth, the Lord said, he found John on the Isle of Patmos and he, John was alone and he said, I want to give you this revelation. And the Lord, if you look in here, it's in red. It's in red. He didn't just speak in the Gospels. He's talking in the book of Revelation. It's in red. And he's explaining to John, this is a revelation of how things are going to be. He said, write what I tell you. And so he begins with Revelation 1 and 1, and he goes all the way down through Revelation 22, and it is an unfolding of a revelation. And it covers millennia. This revelation covers millennia. It doesn't cover a few days or a few years or a few decades. It covers everything. It answers all the questions. And Revelation is the only book in the Bible that says that there's a special blessing for those that read this book. And that's why I've made a life choice for me to study as, know as much as I can, especially about Revelation. I taught the whole book of Revelation three times at Brownsville on Wednesday nights. Every time I taught it, the crowd swelled to hundreds of people, sometimes filled up the sanctuary on the bottom floor on Wednesday nights as I taught the book of Revelation. And it was just that people are interested. They were back then, they're more interested right now. I think many people wish they could hear that. I taught the book of Daniel twice, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, did the same thing in the book of Revelation. 
But the Bible says for those that will read this book, there's a special blessing for those that will read this book and understand this book. God will give you understanding of it. The book of Revelation, once you understand it, is not, uh, not difficult. When you first read it, it's like, I'll never understand that. But as the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you and uses a teacher to help teach you, it's not a complicated book at all. You begin to see it unfold. Revelation unfolds. And so in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, verse 1, it says, I saw the Lamb open one of the seals. Now this is after the church age. This is after the church is caught up in the book of Revelation, chapter 4. This is after he seated on the throne. A search is made in heaven. See who's worthy to open the book. And they saw a lamb, and then they saw a lion. Well, the Bible said that the lamb prevailed, and the lamb took the book, opened one of the seals, and it said, I heard as it was the noise of thunder. So now we're getting a glimpse into heaven right before the tribulation begins. Following the thunder, there's the most, one of the most mind-boggling statements that's ever been found in the Scripture, and it has to do that when he opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven. It said there was silence in heaven about the space of a half hour. Now, what does that mean? There was no angels crying, holy, holy, holy. There was no singing. There was no choirs. There was no proclamations. Nothing. Dead silence for the space of about a half hour. Not one single sound can be heard in heaven. God is silent. Holy Spirit silent. The populace of heaven that has been there for millennia is all silent. Why? Is there any precedence in Scripture for everything being silent? There is. One of them is found in Zechariah. It said, The Lord shall inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord. But he's raised up out of his holy habitation. Now back up and you'll see what this means. It says the Lord is about to inherit Jerusalem and choose Jerusalem and inherit Judah as his portion. So he's about to inherit that. It's been promised to him all these years. So now in the book of Revelation, now all the saints have been caught up to heaven except the saints are still on the earth during the tribulation period. Tribulation is going on on the earth. He's unloosing the seals. When the seventh seal is unloosed, there's dead silence in heaven. Why is there silence? Because he's about to inherit his inheritance. And he's about to choose what has been promised to him through the ages by his Father, God Almighty. So we see that he's ready now to claim his inheritance, and all things are now being put in their place. So back in Revelation, there's seven judgment angels. And they stand before the Lord. And they're waiting to be given the word to fulfill their assignments. There's seven of them that's standing before the Lord. We see this because the Lord gives this to John, the revelator, and he gives the details. And the Lord said, these seven angels are there. So I'm telling you, I sense and I believe that in heaven right now there's all kinds of activity going on, and I believe that those angels are getting ready, if they're not already ready, to take their place, and they're waiting to be given the word to fulfill their assignments and to go forth and do His command that has been determined since before the earth was even made. So there's silence in heaven, holy silence, anticipation silence, incomprehensible silence. Just before the culmination of the ages, God and His heavens are completely silent. What ends the silence? Revelation 8, verses 1 through 6, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half hour. I saw seven angels now, which stood before God, and to them was assigned seven trumpets. Okay, now let's look at this. It's quiet. He's about to receive his inheritance. Everything is going on in heaven. That's the judicial center of the entire universe. The focus is on the earth. The focus is on the earth that has been mortgaged by Adam to Satan. And God is about to 
loose the seals that invalidates the mortgage of the earth because Adam mortgaged the earth to Satan. And so the angels are standing before the Lord. It said they're standing before God, and there's seven of them. And it says they were given seven trumpets. Each angel was given a trumpet. That trumpet that's being assigned to those angels, when they sound that trumpet, it is so prophetic. It is such a profound trumpet, not a regular trumpet, but a God trumpet that when it sounded, it starts breaking the hell off the earth. And the Bible said to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which before the throne. And smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar, cast it to the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So in other words, before the angels sound the trumpets, there's another angel that has the incense and the prayers of the saints that's been bottled up through the millennia. The prayers of the saints, the intercessors, the praying people of God. All those prayers have been bottled up. Now it's mixed with, mixed with incense. When the prayers and the incense goes up, the Bible says that there's all kinds of things that begins to happen. Voices, thunderings, lightnings, earthquake. It's powerful. And the seven trumpets and the seven angels, now they're bringing the trumpet up to their mouth and they're getting ready to sound it. They're ready to take the stage. When Jesus appeared to John on the Isle of Patmos, his eyes was on fire. John said, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I, seven, I saw seven golden candlesticks. That's the church. That's the people of God down through the ages, seven golden candlesticks. In the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, he was clothed down to the feet, girt about the paps of the golden girdle, his head was white like wool. His hairs were white as snow, which stands for purity and holiness. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, which means he's a purifying fire. What's he doing? He's walking in among the golden candlesticks. What's he doing? He's inspecting the church. White, pure, holy God. Hair is white like wool, white like snow, golden paps all the way down. His eyes like flames of fire, and he's looking over the church world. He's looking over the church age. Could I tell you something? You better believe what I'm telling you. God's not going to let no junk in heaven. He ain't going to let no junk in heaven. He's looking over the church. He's looking me over. He's looking you over. He's looking church of his presence over. He's looking all denominations, non-denominations over. It's one final look. Why is he looking it over like this? Because all this stuff is about to happen, and he's inspecting his people. Time has come to deal with Jezebel spirits. I said the time has come to deal with Jezebel spirits in the church. Time has come to deal with lukewarmness. Time has come to deal with false teachings. Fornicators, active homosexuals and lesbians, and fornicators and adulterers, all of them. Get them out. It's time for the church to get cleaned up. And he's removing all the stumbling blocks. He's getting rid of all the secret concealed sins. He's getting rid of the unforgiveness. He's getting rid of those that's carrying offenses. And he's getting rid of judgmentalism. He's saying, get cleaned up if you're going to be a part of where I'm going. Somebody give God praise today. So John is in heaven, and he's seeing all this, 
And Jesus is talking to him, but he's seeing a vision while Jesus is talking. Jesus is the narrator. John is the scribe. He's writing down and, and inscribing what the narrator's telling him. And John said, I saw incredible movements in heaven and on the earth, just as if he was seated in a war room. He was in the room of high command of heaven, and Jesus is explaining everything to him. And the Bible said the seven angels came out of the temple, those seven angels that were standing before God, and they had the seven trumpets. They had seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and their breasts were girded about with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from the power of God. No man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So these angels, how jurisdictional power to pour out and to activate the wrath of God in the earth. Now let me stop right here and explain this to you. When Adam turned everything over to Satan, he turned over his authority, he turned over the earth, he turned over the animal creation, the mammals, the fowls, he turned over everything, including the heavens, the atmospheric heavens, he turned it over to Satan. Satan then held the mortgage of the earth. He turned it over to Satan and it was mortgaged to Satan. And the Bible even calls Satan the God of this world because Adam turned it over to him. What is the the scene that I'm reading to you and I'm setting the stage to explain to you, what is the scene here? This is the early beginnings where God is saying, Satan has a hand like this on the earth, but I'm giving you angels the power of my wrath that when you sound these trumpets, it's going to pry the devil's fingers loose off the earth one by one. And by the time the tribulation is over, Earth has been set free, and there's a new king in town. So the Bible says another angel is going to get so bad. Another angel, he's flying through heaven with an everlasting gospel. Now look this way just for a minute. During the tribulation period when the church is gone, and actually most of the activity of the Holy Spirit is gone, with the exception of leading 144,000 to the Lord and anointing the 144,000 to preach during the tribulation period. But the advent of the Holy Spirit as we've known it will change. And so whenever the church is gone, the advent of the Holy Spirit will be much different than it is right now. So when all hell breaks loose and the church is gone, there's going to be such trouble break out on the earth that the Bible said it'll be so much trouble. It'll be so thick and so complicated and evil men will be so in charge and in so just have a grasp on everything that even churches, there'll be no churches like that. There'll be no evangelists. There'll be no pastors. And any attempt to preach the gospel, they'll be snuffed out. There'll be spies everywhere. And they'll snuff out anybody that's trying to propagate the gospel. It gets so bad that the angels literally have to fly through heaven preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they will fly through heaven and shout down to the people on the earth, Repent! It's coming to a close! Turn to God! Look at this. I saw an angel flying through heaven. It said, having the everlasting gospel, the gospel, they're preaching the gospel, repentance, turn to God. And they're preaching to them that dwell on the earth and every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, that world system, that ungodly world system. See, when the angels start releasing judgment, hell's kingdom don't have a dog's chance to stand no more. 
I said, the devil's kingdom don't have a dog's chance. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Somebody shout praise God. Babylon has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So angels emerge calling for a sickle. Another angel steps forth now, and he's calling for a sickle to be stuck into the earth. Another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle. You know what a sickle's for? It's for reaping. What God's going to do is God's going to call the earth and everything in the earth He's going to call it up, and he's going to stick in his sickle, and he's going to say, time's up. And he's going to stick in the sickle and reap everything, because it's reaping time. It's time to give an account for everything. Sin will be finished. Time to stick in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Let me tell you what's going on right now. You look in music, and you see that now music has been so perfected. Everything has been so perfected. You look in colors. Colors have been perfected. Buildings have been perfected. Construction has been perfected. Talent has been perfected in people. Everything's been perfected. Medical, everything's been perfected. They can do surgery now on people, heart surgery, all kinds of surgery, heart transplant. Everything's being perfected. Everything's being perfected. The harvest of the earth is ripe. Time's up. Got to this place, time's up. So the angel comes and sticks in his sickle to reap the harvest of the earth. And everything on the earth has now got to give an account. And so the angel has that sickle. It said another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are now fully ripe. In other words, what God's going to do is He's going to reap the sin. He's going to bring to the fore all the sin that's been committed. Now it's ripe. Stick in your sickle. We're going to deal with the sin issue finally. And it said, cast it to the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress even to the horse's bridles, about the space of a thousand and six hundred furloins. Every creature, every one of these creatures, every one of these angels is right there, punctual, got their trumpets, they're ready to take their stage, they're about to lift it up. They're not late. They're not early. Everything's getting ready. I beheld in another angel flying through the heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven upon the earth, to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. He opened the bottomless pit, the angel did, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun of the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Sixth angel, which had the trumpet, said, Loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour, a day, and a month, and a year to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army were 200,000, thousand, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision... And them that sat on them, having the breastplate of fire, jasoneth, brimstone, heads of horses, etc., etc. By these were the third part of men killed by fire, by smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouth. And they had power in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents. And their heads, when they bit, they do hurt. Awesome sights. When we're gone, Tribulation begins. These angels are going to go down in the underworld that has never been loosed, and they're going to loose creatures out of the underworld to come up on the earth to help bring judgment on those that's left after the coming of Christ. And the Bible said they'll be able to sting men with a sting like a scorpion, and men will not be able to die. 
it would be a, a horrendous, terrifying sight to see these demon creatures loose from the bottomless pit. I didn't make this up. I just read it to you. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe this? I'm just reading to you what's already written in the scriptures. Those of you watching me at home, you know that that's in your Bible. How close are we to that happening? I would say really close. Now watch this. What awesome insights the Bible gives us. John saw all of it. John saw great preparations also for the marriage supper of the Lamb. I like that, don't you? Can't you imagine having a party for all the saints of God that's ever been? Old Testament, New Testament. Can't you imagine what that table looks like? It's going to require a lot of help. It's going to require a lot of cooking. I can smell it now, can't you? <laughs> it's going to require a lot of servers. It's going to require angels. It's going to require other creatures in heaven as the Lord gets ready to have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Oh, my God. Just imagine the activity that's going on behind the scenes in the banquet room of heaven. Oh, my God. Just to think about how great God is and how excellent He does everything. Can't you imagine what that's going to look like? Oh, Lord. I'll feel like Mephibosheth sitting at the table of David. Praise God. <laughs> heaven is ready. Heaven's preparing. Heaven's busy. Say it with me. Heaven's busy right now. Right now. Say it again. Heaven's busy right now. It is. No doubt about it. Well, let's look at the kingdom of Satan. The second thing where we want to peek into is the kingdom of Satan. Satan is working feverishly right now, preparing the world for the debut of the Antichrist and his false prophet and deception on a level that the world has never seen before. Satan is, is working behind the scenes right now to make this happen. You're beginning to see some of the furniture being put in place. You're beginning to see some of the stage being set for the debut of the man of sin and the false prophet. You're beginning to see it. Everything's being put in place. So heaven is ready. Heaven is preparing. Hell is preparing. So the curtain is about to be raised here before too very long on the greatest deception that's ever been known to mankind. The Bible says, Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he has just a short time. So this, the devil knows and you need to know that this is going to be a short season. It will not last long. The entire rule of the Antichrist, the bad rule of the Antichrist is only 42 months, three and a half years. But his entire rule is seven years. The first three and a half is basically a period of introduction to gain ascendancy in the earth among the nations. The last three and a half years, the last 42 months, is a time that that's, that's going to be his tenure. That's where he's going to give, the devil's going to give his best shot to unseat Christ and to thwart his plans for a messianic rule on the earth for eternity. It's his, it's his plans to thwart the opening up of the new Jerusalem in eternity with the saints of God to live forever and ever with him. Satan's going to try to stop it. We are bystanders. And we're going to see these things. We're going to see them preparing. We're going to see the things moved around and putting on the stage and getting ready. I don't know how long we'll be here. I personally believe, and I have preached and believed for years, that we're going to be gone when the tribulation takes place on the earth. But if we're not, I'm not worried about it because if we're still here, God's going to watch out for us and take care of us. <laughs> But I believe with all my heart, and I preach it, I still believe in the rapture, and I still preach on the rapture. And I know that just gives some of you heartburn like nobody doesn't. <laughs> but get over it, friend. Praise God. When you see my feet going up, you're going to say, oh, I wish I'd have believed like John did. <laughs> Satan is so thoroughly convinced that he believes that he's going to be able to stop Christ from coming back. Could I tell you something about Satan? 
He never learns. Never learns. He's been defeated all down through these millennials, and he's about to get the biggest defeat he's ever had. And Jesus Christ is going to prevail. Somebody say, Jesus Christ is going to prevail. So, but here's what you need to understand now. Here's what you need to understand. In these last days, the devil's attention is not going to be on the sinner. It's not going to be on the sinner. He's got them. It's not going to be on the agnostic. It's not going to be on the, uh, the pornographer. The attention of the devil is not going to be on the apostates. It's not going to be on the lukewarms. His attention is going to be on the very elect of God. He's going to be looking at the people of God. He's setting his heart and setting his mind and all of his concentrated powers to, to release the greatest power of deception that the world has ever known, and he's going to release it on the people of God. And the Bible says, Jesus made the statement, if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. So you know what? I preached that message last Friday night, and I got nothing as far as I know. I've got nothing but good reports back. But you know the reason why I preached that? is because I felt like the Lord is saying to me, get out ahead of this thing, son, and tell people before these things start happening. Get out ahead of it. Get out ahead of it. And start telling the people about these things so they'll be ahead of it. When these things start happening, they'll say, yeah, Kilpatrick told me about that. Or the Holy Spirit reminded me of that. That's what I'm doing. So some of you watching me by television or watching me by live streaming, you may think, he's crazy. What's he talking about this for? I, I, there's a rhyme and reason for it, friend. I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> Now, I want, to, I want to show you something here real quickly. This, this is so good. Satan is going after the church. But now, I want you to listen to Scripture in Thessalonians. This thing really, every time I read this, this grips me. And I want you to listen to it. It's in the King James Version. The Bible said, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and lying, signs and lying wonders. Now, Apostle Paul, in writing, writing to the second letter to the church at Thessalonica, said, even him, that is the Antichrist, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness because they receive not the love of the truth. I can stand up here and I can share these things with you from the Bible and you know in your heart that it's true. I know in my heart that it's true. But you have to receive truth. You can't just hear truth. You've got to receive truth and believe truth. And listen to this. You know, the other night I got up here and I was talking about before I preached the message. But, you know, y'all going to hear me use some terminologies and you're going to think I'm crazy. Well, I came across this scripture in Corinthians and Paul is basically sounding just like I did last Friday night before I preached that message. You want to hear it? It's in the New Living Testament, our translation, the New Living Translation. Look at this. It's going to be on the screen. Paul said, I hope you'll put up with me a little while and a little bit more of my foolishness. <laughs> look, now, I want you to listen to this. This is true. The Apostle Paul said this. He, look at it. He said, I hope you'll put up with a little more of my foolishness. Please bear with me. Sound just like me last Friday night, doesn't it? <laughs> I said, hey, hey, John, uh, Paul, me and you's tight. Hey, we're tight. Look what he said. I'm jealous of you. I'm jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. What Paul was saying is I'm not trying to reach in and get the bride's affection I'm trying to tell the bride the truth so that when you're presented to Christ, I have done my part. I didn't draw you to me, but I drew you to Christ. Let that be a lesson to all of us preachers in these last days. Stop trying to draw the people around you. Start directing them toward the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I'm jealous 
of God himself, or with the jealousy of God himself, I promised you as a pure bride to one husband Christ. But I fear that somehow, Paul said, I, I'm just uneasy about this, that your pure and undivided devotion to Christ is going to somehow be corrupted. Just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. You happily, in other words, you're real tolerant. You put up with whatever anyone tells you. You don't check it out. You put up with any, what anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus, you'll sit there and amen them. You ain't got enough spiritual sense to know when you're hearing truth and when you're hearing a lie. Now I'm preaching better than y'all act. He said, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach, or a different kind of a spirit than the one you received, or a different kind of a gospel than the one you believe, Paul said, you're too tolerant of this stuff. What is wrong with you? This is not the Jesus that we set forth before you. This is another Jesus. And this is not the gospel. And he said, look at this now, verse 13. This is so good. He said, these people are false apostles. What? False apostles? Are they on the evening news? No, they're in your church. Well, I'm not going to preach no more until y'all get with me. Come on, get with me. He said, these people are false apostles. This is Paul writing. And he's writing about these things. He's going through hell for what he believes. And he's saying the church is just opening up to anything, anywhere. And that's what we need to realize in these last days. It's time for us to know who we are, what we believe, and come on. Yes. Yes. He said these people are false apostles. They are deceitful workers. They shape shift. I want you to hear me now. Hear me. They disguise themselves. They're false apostles. They're evil. They're devilish. They have a bad spirit. They're not of Christ. It's another gospel. And they can shape shift and come right into your classrooms and your pulpits. And what they're doing, he said, is they disguise themselves as humble apostles of Jesus Christ. And then one day when you learned they weren't really apostles and they were really imposters, you lose faith and run away from God. So somebody's got to be savvy enough to be at the door and say, no, you're not coming in. Come on, give God praise. It said they're deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. But I'm not surprised, he said. He said, even Satan shapeshifts himself as an angel of light. Look at that, shapeshifting. Satan, he's a spirit, and he can shapeshift him as a pious religious leader. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Listen to this. Paul said this. He said, so it's no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, shape-shifting, and in the end, they'll get their punishment from their wicked de deeds that they deserve. So what the Apostle Paul is saying here is the first sight that we get into heaven is the angels scurrying around getting ready to sound their trumpets and for things to start happening on the earth. But now we're seeing that the Antichrist is not going to be going after the sinner, not going to be going after the pornographer. He's going after the elect of God. What for? To deceive them. To deceive them. And many people won't even know they've been deceived. That's why we have to have somebody behind the pulpit that says, hey, 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 you straighten up. Stop that. This is of the devil, and you know it's of the devil. Somebody's got to do it. 
I don't want to be the high sheriff of heaven going around straightening everybody out. Uh-oh, here comes Kilpatrick. He's the one in the white hat. <laughs> but what he's saying is Satan is raging and he's exhausting every effort to set up his own Messiah. See, Satan knows that Jesus is the Messiah. So before we're going to have a chance to see him at his coming, Satan's going to set up a false Messiah first. Let me tell you a story. Y'all knew this was coming, didn't you? Whenever I was praying with my pastor years ago as a teenager, I was 15, I think 14 or 15. My mother always cooked me breakfast every morning before I had to go to high school. <clears throat> and I was asleep in the bed. I, I was awake. I'd already waken up. I heard her in there humming, and she was making my breakfast. There was a shoe in the door because we had attic fan, and that attic fan would draw air in. You know, you sleep really good on that attic fan. But anyway, I had a shoe in the door, but I could hear a mother down the hall uh, humming as she was making my breakfast. All of a sudden, the door to my bedroom opened up, and in walked what looked like Christ. And everything in me just wanted to fall out of that bed and grab him around the ankles and worship him. And I felt reluctance, but I didn't know why I felt reluctance. It's just like everything in me wanted to just worship him. And I heard a voice say to me, but where's his nail scars? And I looked, and there was no nail scars in his hands, no nail scars in his feet. And I remember I raised up. I was just a teenager. But I raised up, and I said, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And he popped like a bubble. Just popped like a bubble and disappeared. So in my life, many times from that precedence that was set that day, many times in my life, I've gotten the false first before I got the real. In other words, the Lord has put me through tests first with the faults that if I could discern that, he'd save the real for me. You see what I'm saying? So look at this. What the scripture is saying here is Satan is raging and he's doing every kind of deceivableness that he can to deceive God's people. And I talked about aliens the other night, not UFO aliens, but I talked about aliens that's what, not from this world, like the fallen angels that saw the daughters of men. And I talked about Satan. And if you go back to Ezekiel and look, it said, thou was in the garden of Eden. And it tells what he looked like before God cursed him. When God cursed him, he looks like a serpent crawling on his belly. He, he looks like somebody you want to run from, but he didn't look like that when he first came in and talked to Adam and Eve. But Satan, Satan right now, is beginning a campaign even among the people of God that will permit it and allow it and can't discern it. He's beginning a campaign right now of deceivableness to deceive people and to make them think this is right and this is an apostle of God and this is the doctrine of the Bible. And the apostle Paul has already plainly said it's another Christ and it's another gospel. And you're going to have to be savvy enough to know what's another gospel and what's the real gospel. What's another Christ and what's the true Christ. You're going to have to know. And if you don't know, get in a church where they'll help you to know. You can't play with this. Because Jesus plainly said, if it's possible, even the very elect will be deceived. So they're causing explosions of false doctrines. These evil spirits are busy. They're working. They know their time is short. They've only got it just a little while. And it's going to be evil seductions where they're going to try to seduce politicians, presidents, prime ministers, queens, kings, prime ministers, all kinds of people. Satanic signs and wonders that's going to be performed by the false prophet and the antichrist, even to the point that the false prophet has the power to pull down far from heaven like Elijah did in the days of the kings. And it caused great conversions of the Jews back to Judeo values. So these spirits, these deceptive spirits are sowing 
restlessness, instability in churches, and even unbelief in churches now, where there's many people that once believed, now they don't believe anymore. And now people are restless. They're looking for something new. They're looking for the latest and the greatest, the biggest wow, the latest wow. And churches are unstable as I've ever seen them right now. People are floating around. They hadn't even gone back to church. They don't care to go back to church necessarily. Many have grown cold. And the devil's sown that instability through this pandemic. And I just have one question. If there's another pandemic on the heels of this one, my God, what's going to happen with that? Are you ready? Let me just ask this question. What if I'm raising something that you need to hear? What if? You say, I don't believe that. But what if? What if? What if you cut on your television set and you see a person that's come out of nowhere and they're extremely charismatic and they have persuasion like you wouldn't believe and they have supernatural power? Do you have what it takes to resist that? But when it pounds you day in and day out, it's hard to resist that unless you're full of the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'll just say this, if you have ever needed the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire, you need it now like you've never needed it before. Listen to this. Hell is getting ready and it's sowing restlessness and instability and unbelief and they're causing the masses to become desensitized even in the church, is becoming desensitized. It's like people have become numb, almost like they're glazed over. It's like they're under stupor of some kind. And what's going on? And they don't even know it. What's going on? And they're not asking questions about themselves. They're just going down the stream of things. This spirit is even causing the masses to become desensitized, even in the church itself. You have the fake media today. Can you believe I'm standing up here in 2021 talking about news that's no longer news anymore? It's a bunch of lies. If you don't think that we're coming close to the coming of Christ, you cut on your TV and you watch TV now and you can't tell if you're hearing a lie or hearing the truth. And you don't know if this politician really did it or he really didn't do it. You don't know if this is going to be legislation or it's going to be, you don't know anymore. Who do you trust? And then the entertainment industry. Oh my God, isn't it amazing how the entertainers now have become experts on morals. The Spirit clearly says that in the latter time, some will abandon the faith. Do you see that? You see that? That's in the NIV. Some will abandon the faith. You know what abandon means? Walk away from it. If you walk away from that, you're walking away from life. If you walk away from this, you're walking away from truth. If you walk away from this, you're wide open. You are wide open. And you're no match for what you're about to walk into. Listen to this. The Bible says, the Spirit says in the last days, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits. And look at this. Look at this. And things taught by demons. Taught by demons? In the Bible call in, in, the, uh, in the universities of America? No. In churches. In pulpits, taught by demons, shape shifting. Oh, I just love brother so and so. Isn't he funny? Listen, it ain't time to be a comedian. It's not. Time. I like to have fun like anybody else, but it's not time to be a comedian. It's time to sober up and to wake up and realize the times that we're living in. Somebody shout, Amen. Woo. Well, I got to close. Number one, the angels are prepared. 
heaven is prepared, making great preparations. Number two, Satan is prepared, and he's about to bring on to the world stage the greatest deception ever known to mankind. But number three, the church is totally unprepared. Unprepared. So the joke in hell is the heartbreak of the church. The joke in hell is, oh, the church, they don't, they're, not, they're not smart enough to even know what's going on. And the demons of hell and the legions of hell are saying, they don't know. They come in there and they amen kill Patrick, but they're wide open. We can do anything we want to do. Boy, I just wonder how the Apostle Paul, if he was, if he could just, if I could just bring him in here next Sunday from heaven and say, now, ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome the Apostle Paul? Whew, my God. <laughs> Can't you imagine? I wouldn't even hug him. I'd crawl back over to my seat. You know? <laughs> but if he could just stand here and just take five minutes and just talk to you, change your life forever. But I'm the Apostle John. <laughs> I'm kidding. So the church, the church is totally unprepared for what's about to happen, and hell knows it. And the Bible says this, and that knowing the time, and that now it's high time to wake out of sleep, now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. Jesus saw the way he painted it in Matthew 25, is he painted a picture of the virgins in the last days. And he said there were 10 of them. He said they all were asleep at midnight. That means the, the fading of that era and the emerging of the Messianic era. This is falling away. This is emerging. And the Bible says that Jesus painted a picture of the 10 virgins. And he said that they were all virgins and they all woke up, but half of them were unprepared. Would you, would you loan us some of your oil? No. You go buy it. We, we, we can't spare it. No. So the picture that Jesus is painting here, and he's not arbitrarily, arbitrarily just trying to think of something to say to put it down on paper. He's telling the truth. He said, in the last days, probably half the church is not going to be ready. He saw a sleeping church, five wise prepared, five foolish unprepared. And the Bible said while they were gone, the ones that was gone that was unprepared, the door shut. No more time to prepare. So with heaven working feverishly, with hell preparing and pulling out all the stops, millions and millions and millions of Christians are fast asleep. And isn't that the way it's always been? During the time that Jesus came the first time, angels were shouting in the heavens, Peace on earth! Goodwill to men everywhere! Behold, a child shall be born a Savior in the city! And all this, and the angels, and the skies lit up, and only the wise men from the east did anything about it. Only the wise men from the east got on their camels and started heading that way, following that star. But everybody else, and the angels is up there saying, wake up, he's born, he's here, the Messiah's here. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? When Jesus is in Gethsemane, and he's about to go to the cross, he's going to become the lamb that's going to take away the sins of the world. Oh my God. <laughs> the disciples are asleep, sound asleep. And the Lord walks in there and says, couldn't you watch with me, guys? Asleep. Asleep. Today, Christians are so worn out. They're so battle-weary. They have wrestled with family matters. They have wrestled with marital matters. They have wrestled with financial issues. They have wrestled with bull demons. They have stood in the gap and stood and believed God for their children. Pastors have battled until they've just battled. They're almost bloody fighting for their church to survive. 
people have been battled with, finance, with uh, health issues and Christians are so worn out. It's like all they want to do is go to sleep. Pastor, don't call a prayer meeting. I can't come. I'm too tired. I'm too weary. I can't come. Let me tell you something. During the revival at Brownsville, when I'd be home in the daytime, I felt like I couldn't go night after night after night. But when I got there, the glory was so strong. The, oh, the glory will lift you. And let me just close by saying this. Let me just close by saying this. I, I'm preaching all these things, and I'm telling you there's activity in heaven, there's activity in hell, and the church is sleeping. But oh, God's not going to let us sleep long. A cry is about to be made. Wake up! The bridegroom cometh! And when we wake up, oh my God, I believe that God is about to send an end time harvest of souls to the nations of the earth globally. Not just a nation, but globally. God's about to wake up his church and the sleeping giant is going to stand up and God is going to do great and mighty things. Come on, give him prayer.